Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Hi everybody, this is George Gilbert, uh, Big Data and Analytics Analyst with Wikibon. We are wrapping up our show on theCUBE today at DataWorks 2017 in San Jose. It has been a very interesting day and we have a special guest to help us do a survey uh, of the wrap up. Uh, George Chow uh, from Simba. Um, we, used to, we used to call him Chief Technology Officer, now he's Technology Fellow but when he was explaining the difference in titles to me, I thought he said technology felon, but uh, he's since corrected me. Yes, very much so. So George and I have been, um, we've, been we've been looking at both Spark, uh, Spark Summit last week and, and DataWorks uh, this week. What are some of the, the big um, advances that really caught your attention? What, what's caught my attention actually is how much manufacturing has really, I think, caught, caught into the streaming data. Um, I think last week, I think, it was very notable that uh, both Volkswagen and Audi actually had case studies for you know, how they're actually using streaming data. And I think, um, the, uh, I think just, just before the break now, there was also a similar session from Ford uh, you know, showcasing what they're doing around streaming data. And, and are they using the, st the streaming uh streaming analytics capabilities for um, the autonomous driving or is it other telemetry that they're, that they're analyzing? The, uh, the uh, what is it, I think um, the Volkswagen st study uh, was, pr was production, because um, I still have to review the notes, but the, the one for, for Audi actually was quite interesting because it was for managing uh, paint defect. For paint? Paint defect. Oh. So they, what they were doing were, they, they were uh, essentially recording the environmental condition uh, that they were painting the cars in, that basically the entire pipeline. To predict when there would be imperfections, because yes. paint is an extremely high value uh, sort of step in the assembly yes. process. Yes, what, what they were trying to do is to essentially uh, make a connection between uh, downstream defects, like future defects, and some of the, trying to pinpoint the causes upstream. So the idea is that if they record all the environmental conditions early on, they could turn around and hopefully okay. figure it out later on. This is, okay, this is great. It sounds really, really concrete. So what are some of the surprising environmental variables that they're tracking? And then what's the technology that they're using um, you know, to, to sort of to build model and then to anticipate if there's a problem? The, uh, I think the, the surprising finding they said they were, uh, were actually, I think it was, I think it was a, a, a humidity or fan speed, if I recall, at the time when the paint was being applied, because essentially paint has to be, it, paint is very sensitive to the to the condition that is being applied to the body. Um, so I, 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 I mean, my recollection was that one one of the finding was that yeah, there was a narrow window during which the paint were like ideal, like in terms of have the least amount of defect. And so, had they built a, had they built a digital twin style model where you know it's like a, a digital replica of some um, aspects of the car, or was it just a more of a predictive model that had telemetry coming at it, and you know when it's outside a certain bound, they know that they're going to have defects down downstream. They, I think they're still working on the predictive model. Oh, actually, the, the model is still still being built because they are essentially trying to essentially build that model to figure out how they should be tuning the, the production pipeline. Got it, so this is, it's sort of in, it's still in the development phase. Yeah, yeah. And can you tell us, did, did they talk about the technologies that they're using? Uh, I remember the, uh, it's, it's a little hazy now because after a couple of weeks of uh, conference, so I, I don't remember the specifics uh, because I was, I was counting on the, uh, the recordings to come out oh, right. uh, in a couple of weeks time, so. Uh, I, I definitely will share that out, I think, but it's a case study to keep an eye on. Were there, so tell us, were there other ones where this um, use of real-time or near real-time data had some applications that we, that we couldn't do before because um, we now, we can do things with very low latency? I think that's the one that I was looking forward to with Ford. Um, uh -huh. That was the session just earlier, I think about like an hour ago. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the session actually consisted of a demo um, that was being done live, you know, it was, it was being streamed to us. 
uh, where they were showcasing the data that was being uh, coming off of the, uh, the of, a, of, a, of a car that's been rigged up. And so, what 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 data were they tracking, and what were they trying to anticipate here? The, uh, they, they didn't get enough detail, but it was basically data coming off the CAN bus of the car. So if, if, you, if anybody's familiar with the uh, well, with that's the CAN, right. you you're a car guru, and you and I compare. Well, our latest favorite is the Porsche Macan. Yes, yes. Uh, SUV. Okay. Yes. So, but but yeah, they they, they were looking at uh, streaming the uh, the performance data of the car as well as location data. Okay, and uh, oh, so this was it. Sounds more like a like a test case, like can we get telemetry data that might be good for insurance or for... Well, they, they, well they, they've built out the system enough using, um, using the Lambda architecture with Kafka, and so they were actually consuming the data in real time, and the, the demo was actually exactly seeing the data being ingested and being acted on. So in the, in the case that they were doing a simplistic uh, uh, visualization of just placing the car uh, on, a, on the Google map so you can basically follow the car around. Okay, so so what was what was the uh, technical components in the car, and then um, sort of how much data were they sending, you know, to some, or or where was the data being sent to, and the, or how much of the data? The, the data was actually sent stream uh, all the way into uh, for its own data centers, so oh. they were using NiFi. Uh -huh. uh, with you know, with all the right NiFi props. NiFi being from HortonWorks, yeah, there, Hortonworks, Hort, yeah. Uh, the yeah. HortonWorks data flow. Yeah, okay. with uh, with all the appropriate proxies and firewall to bring it all the way into a secure environment. Wow! So it, it, it was quite impressive from the point of view of it was live data coming off of the 4G modem, or actually being uploaded through the 4G modem in wow. the car. Okay. Did they say how much um, compute? and storage um, they needed in the, the device, in this case, the car? The, uh, I think they were using a very light, lightweight platform. They were, they were streaming apparently from the Raspberry Pi. Oh, interesting. Off, um, but they were very guarded about what, is avail what, what was um, inside the data center because you know, for competitive reasons. Um, you know, they couldn't share much about how big and how, how large a scale okay. uh, they could operate at. So, so Simba has been doing ODBC and JDBC drivers to st standard APIs to databases for a long time. Mm -hmm. That was all about, that was an era where either it was interactive or, or batch. Mm -hmm. So how is streaming sort of big picture going to change the way applications are built? Well, the one way to think about streaming is that if you, if you look at many of these APIs, let's say, oh, many of these systems, I think like Spark is a good like, example where they're trying to um, harmonize streaming and batch, or rather to take away the, the need to, to deal with it as a streaming system as opposed to a batch system. I mean, because it's obviously much easier to um, think about and reason about your system when it is uh, traditional, like in the traditional batch model. So the way that I see it also happening is that streaming systems will Will, will, you can say will adapt, will actually become easier to build. And everyone is, is trying to make it easier to build so that you don't have to think about and reason about as a streaming system. Okay, so this is really important. But they have to make a trade-off if they do it that way. So there's the desire for leveraging skill sets which were all batch oriented, mm -hmm. and then and, and sort of presumably SQL, which is sort of a data manipulation everyone's comfortable with. Um, but then, if you're doing it batch oriented, you have a, a like a, a portion of time where you're not sure you have the final answer. And, and I assume if you were in a streaming first solution, mm -hmm. you would explicitly know whether you have all the data or don't, well, as opposed to late arriving stuff that yes, might come later. But what I'm referring to is actually the programming model. All I'm saying is that yeah. uh, more and more people will want streaming applications, but more and more people need to develop it, um, you can say, quickly, without having to build it in a very specialized fashion. So when you look at, let's say, the example of Spark, when they, when they focus on structured streaming, uh, the, the whole idea is to make it possible for you to develop the app without having to write it from scratch. And, and the comment about SQL is, is actually exactly to on point because the idea is that you want to work with the data 
yeah. uh, you can say, uh, uh, it, m not mindful, actually, n n not with any special, with, not with a lot of work to, to, um, to account for the fact that it is actually streaming data that could arrive out of order even. And so the, the, the whole idea is that if you can build applications in a more consistent way, irrespective of whether it's batch or streaming, you're, you're better off. So, um, last week, um, uh, even though we didn't have a major release of Spark, we had like a point, uh, point release or t discussion about the 2.2 release. Mm -hmm. um, and that's of course very relevant for our big data ecosystem since Spark has become the compute engine for it. Mm -hmm. um, explain the significance uh, where the reaction time, or the latency, for Spark went down from several hundred milliseconds to one millisecond or below. What, what are the implications for the programming model and for the um, applications you can build with it? Mm. The, 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 that, the actually, hit, hitting that new, uh, you can say, the, the, new, the new threshold, the millisecond is actually a very important milestone because you know, when you look at a typical scenario, let's say with ad tech where you're serving ads, yeah. um, you, you really only have maybe on the order of about 100 or maybe 200 millisecond max to actually turn around. And that max includes a bunch of things, yeah, not that, just the yes. calculation. Yeah, and, and that, that, let's say 100 millisecond, includes network transfer time. So, which means that in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in your in your in your real budget, you only have allowances for maybe under 10, 10 or under 10 to 20 millisecond to actually compute and do any work. So being able to actually have a system that delivers, you know, millisecond level of performance actually gives you ability to use Spark right now in that scenario. Okay. So in other words, now they can they can claim, even if it's not per event processing, they can claim that they can react so fast that it's as good as per event processing. Yes. Is, is that fair to say? Yes, that's very okay. fair. That's that's significant. So what what um, type, how would you see applications changing? I know we've only got like another minute or two, but how do you see applications changing now that Spark has been designed for people who have traditional batch-oriented skills, but who can now, you know, learn how to do streaming real-time applications without learning anything really new? What sort of, how will that change what we see next year? Well, I, I think we should be careful to 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 to, um, to not pigeonhole Spark as something built for batch, because I think the idea is that the 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 uh, the um, you can say the originators of Spark, you know, um, know that it's all about the ease of development and it's the ease of reasoning about your system. It's not yeah. the fact that the technology is built for batch. So the fact that you could use your knowledge and experience and, and an API that actually is familiar right. to leverage it for something that you can build for streaming. I mean, that, that's the power and you can say that that's the strength of what uh, the, uh, the, the Spark uh, project has, has, has kind of taken on. Okay, we're going to have to end it on that note. Um, there's so much more to go through. Um, George, you will be back as a, a favorite guest on the show. There'll be many more uh, interviews to come. Thank uh, you. With that, this is George Gilbert. We are at DataWorks 2017 in San Jose. We had a great day today. We learned a lot from uh, Rob Bearden and Rob Thomas up front about the IBM deal. We had Scott Nowell, CTO of uh, Hortonworks on several times. And we've come away with uh, an appreciation for uh, a partnership now between IBM and Hortonworks that can take the two of them into, uh, into uh, a set of use cases that neither one uh, uh, on its own could really handle before. So today was a significant day. Tune in tomorrow, we have uh, another uh, great set of guests. Um, keynotes start at nine, and our guests will be on starting at 11. So with that, this is George Gilbert signing out. Have a good night.